So, we've assembled, we've gotten into church, and now we're going to sing some antiphons. Bottom of this first page. Pages 14 to 33. So, advance your book to page 14. What are antiphons? First, does everybody know what the Byzantine rite is? We talked about the Byzantine Catholic Church. What is Byzantium? The name for the city of Constantinople, which was the, which was one of the most important churches, cities in the ancient church. It was a major bishopric, patriarchate. It was the capital of the Roman Empire in the east after the fall of Rome. Okay? and the liturgy of the city, because every major city had its own liturgies. The liturgy of Constantinople spread to all the lands around it. The entire Orthodox Church, the entire Orthodox Church follows the Byzantine liturgy, and a number of the Eastern Catholic churches all do. Okay? Every liturgy, sorry, every liturgical family, like the liturgies of Rome or of Byzantium, Constantinople, or of Antioch, has its own kind of little quirks because they all developed and evolved. In the Byzantine rite, which means the liturgy used by all the churches that inherited it from Byzantium, from Constantinople, three psalms and a litany is a basic unit of liturgy. It's something we do. Okay? Three psalms. And it shows up in Vespers, it shows up in all sorts of other places. It shows up in the Divine Liturgy. On the way to church in Constantinople on a feast day, you would not go to the church that you're actually going to have the Eucharist in. You'd go to a different church. And people would gather there, and there would be a priest there and a deacon and a reader. And there would be a psalm chanted by the reader. And after every verse of the psalm, the people would sing a refrain, like, uh, Glory to you, O Lord, or through the prayers of the Mother of God, save us, or Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. And these little verses, refrains, were called from the Greek word for refrain, traparia. That's where our traparia come from. They're these little tiny hymn things that the people would sing. Why didn't the people sing the whole psalm? Yeah, they'd have to memorize it. They'd have to have books or already know them. But the reader, of course, can chant the psalm and everybody sings the refrain afterwards. So, as it finally developed, on Sundays, the reader going to the first church would sing, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, sing praise to his name, give to him glorious praise. And the people would respond through the prayers of the Theotokos, O Savior, save us. And then you'd chant another verse and sing the refrain all the way to the end of the psalm. And then you'd sing glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever, amen. And the people would sing it one more time. And then they'd stop and you'd say, oh, we're at, the, we're at another church. The deacon would chant a litany, a short little lit, a little litany. They would gather some more people there. They would do the same thing and go off to another church, chanting another psalm. So this would be accumulating from in the city. More and more people would be gathering the procession. You'd have one psalm with a refrain, and then another psalm and a refrain, and then a third psalm and a refrain, and finally you're at the church where the liturgy is going to be celebrated for the feast day for everybody in that part of the city. So these antiphons were really, I think what the Roman Catholics call a gathering song or an entrance hymn. These are the hymns that you sing. Now, we no longer do these processions normally, except maybe on Pascha and Holy Monday. Okay, Patronal Feast Day, we can do processions. But normally we stay in the church, but in the Byzantine Rite we tend not to get rid of things. We may shorten them a little bit. Like our antiphons... Uh, usually we would do four verses or three verses or just one verse the way we have today. But we keep the basic form. So let's look at what the antiphons look like. On Sunday, Psalm 65 is the first antiphon. Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth, sing praise to his name, give to him glorious praise. And then the people's refrain is, through the prayers of the Theotokos, the Savior save us. Skip to the end, the cantor sings glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. 
now and ever and forever, amen. And the people sing the refrain again. We omit the antiphon, or we omit the litany. We're done with the first antiphon. Now, the first antiphon, the first psalm was 65. What's the next psalm? 66. The Byzantines also like to do psalms in order. If they're fitting, they will skip psalms. For example, if you're doing Sunday psalms and you suddenly come across a penitential psalm, sometimes we'll just skip that one. Okay? Psalms chosen for appropriate reasons are important. On the, the second antiphon on Sundays, be gracious to us, O God, and bless us. Let your face shine upon us and have mercy on us. And then the refrain is, O Son of God, risen from the dead, save us who sing to you, hallelujah. Now, I want, I want you to notice there is no bar line in either of those refrains. Through the prayers of the Theotokos, O Savior, save us. Now it's a little bit long. Take a good breath. If you have to break it, just you can steal a breath in the middle. But it's even more important in the second antiphon. O Son of God, risen from the dead, breath, save us who sing to you, alleluia. Notice the colon. Save us who sing to you, alleluia. Save the people that are singing alleluia. Not save us who sing to you, period. Alleluia. They're a little different, okay? We are saying, we are praising you and we ask you to save us. It's relational. Okay? So if you can sing that, and I would, I would say, I hate to do this. No, I don't hate to do it here. In general, I do. I don't write in books. And my wife will tell you it, it takes an act of Congress or St. Peter or something to get me to write in a book. I write in my green book, and I would put in something like no pause, just as a reminder. So that's on Sundays, and now this little circle in an arrow that says go to page 18. I hope you know what that means. Some of our people certainly don't. Okay? I don't like giving page numbers in church ever unless there's really a desperate need, but if there's some way that we can get our people to recognize the helps in this book to navigate it, it's a good thing. Okay? So... We skip to page 18. Now, the other thing that the Byzantines liked to do is you will do something and do something and do something twice or three times. Then you do something different. Okay, you switch tone or you sing something different. And in this case, we get to the glory now and ever in the second antiphon. And by rights, you would expect that we would sing, O Son of God, risen from the dead, save us who sing to you, Alleluia. But we don't. We sing a hymn that was written in the 6th century, during a great time of dispute over who Jesus Christ was, and there were a lot of heresies around, and the emperor, a major figure of the time, wrote a hymn that expressed the church's teaching, and so they put it in here. Instead of singing, O, so o Son of God, risen from the dead, or wondrous in your saints, we sing, O only begotten Son and Word of God, who, being immortal, Deigned for our salvation to become incarnate of the holy Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary, and became man without change. You were also crucified, O Christ our God, and by death have trampled death, being one of the Holy Trinity, glorified with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Save us. Okay, now that whole middle section is expressing what we believe about Jesus Christ and the Incarnation. But if you boil it down to grammar, what does it say? O only begotten Son and Word of God, save us. The beginning and the end. It's one long sentence. It's really a lot like, O Son of God, risen from the dead, save us who sing to you. But it's become theology. Now, there's a little A in front of this. That means there's a version A. There's one melodic version. And then there's a B version, which is just Resurrection or Troparian Tone 7, and a C version. You can pick any one of those. If you pick a new one, go use it for a couple of weeks to teach the people, but you can use any one of these. One of the biggest problems that I have going into a parish that says, where the cantor says I need help with things, is they will often say, I have to use all of the A's in a given liturgy. Or I have to use all the B's together in a given liturgy. That is not what this is for. 
in almost every in most cases where there are different versions, you can pick and choose which ones we're going to use. Where there are exceptions, we'll talk about them today. Okay, so you can choose any one of those three hymns of the incarnation, and that's the end of the second antiphon. That's for Sunday. Let's go back to page 14. Those are the Sunday first and second antiphons. And then on page 15, we have the weekday antiphons. Let's see, what's the, first, the psalm for the first weekday antiphon? It is 91. 91. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. That's a great opening for the Eucharist. It's good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name. Same refrain through the prayers of the Theotokos. Glory now and ever in the refrain. And then the second antiphon, the Lord reigns. He is clothed in majesty. Robed is the Lord and girt about with strength. Through the prayers of your saints. What was it on Sunday? O oh, Son of God, risen from the dead. So on Sunday we sing to Christ. And on weekdays, we sing to the saints and ask their prayers. We're going to see this pattern a lot. And then again, it goes, says, go to the only begotten. There are two other options. One of them is on feasts of the Lord, they have their own first and second antiphon. Those will be in the back of the book. But they all use the same sort of melody. And finally, inherited from the Greek monastic and from the Russian tradition, there are also things called typical psalms. These are psalms from the communion service. These are preparation for communion psalms that at some point, in some parts of the church, they said, you know, if we're going to receive communion at the Divine Liturgy, we should sing some of the pre-communion psalms. psalms. So they got put in here. The, fir the first psalm is always 102. Second is 145. We just sing little excerpts of each. There are two different versions. A simple melody and a more complicated melody, A and B, use them together. If you use the simple melody for the first dance, antiphon, use the simple melody for the second. That's why they're put together. When do we use this? You can use them on any, according to this, on any Sunday when there is not, when there aren't feast day antiphons. So let's say if uh, Palm Sunday, you would use the Palm Sunday antiphons, but any other Sunday that just Anytime you could use the regular Sunday antiphons, you can replace them with these. Now, there is a tradition, small t, in our church, that they're used during the fasting seasons. Okay? That's at least in part because they were put in a book with Lenten hymns. And people got used to using them. Uh, it goes back a ways. It is purely local custom on when, when you use them. And some priests have very firm ideas about when they would like to use them for variety. Okay, to do something different. The first and second typical psalms are sh a bit shorter, especially in the simple form, than the antiphons. But whenever you sing the typical psalms, as you, sing, say, as, you, as you do, you also sing the Beatitudes later, which are longer. We'll get to that. So first and second antiphon. And then the O Only Begotten Son, that's really the ending of the second antiphon. And then we get to the third antiphon. Now, to explain the third antiphon, I'd like to talk about feast days. I talk about feast days because anytime we have a very solemn day in the church, we suddenly go backwards and do things a little bit older way. So, for example, on Easter, on Easter and in Lent, in Holy Week, we do things that are kind of old-fashioned even for the Byzantine rite. And as we sing things, we don't sing the rest of the year, that sort of thing. Now, does anyone know on a Feast of the Lord what's special about the third antiphon? There is a refrain. See, normally we look at this and we don't see a refrain in here, right? Because the first antiphon, through the prayers of the Theotokos, that's the refrain. And the second antiphon is, O Son of God, risen from the dead. That's the refrain. I don't see a refrain here. Well, if you will turn to page, let's find a good one say, September 14th, page two, please turn to page 254, and let's look at the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. Actually, let's start on 253, the beginning. Okay, we have a first antiphon, my God, my God, hear me, why have you forsaken me? Yeah, that's related to the cross. Through the prayers of the Theotokos, glory through the prayers of the Theotokos, that's what we expect. 
And then the second antiphon, why, O God, have you cast us off forever? Glory to the Father, only begotten Son. That's the second antiphon. And then the third antiphon, the Lord is king, let the peoples rage. He is enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. And then we sing what? Save your people, O Lord, and bless your inheritance. Grant victory to your church over evil, and protect your people by your cross. Remember I said that Treparian started out as something that people would sing as a refrain? That's one of them. Originally, this was an entire psalm, and after every verse... People would sing, save your people, oh, Lord. probably at a good clip, okay? We just sing the first verse, and then we sing the Traparian, and then we sing the final verse. This is a special verse that was considered appropriate as we walk into the church where we're going to have the Eucharist. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, for he is holy. And then we sing the refrain again, the Traparian, Okay? And then we sing glory now and ever, and we sing what? The Kentuckian. Okay? That's, it feels weird on feast days to do this. I sing the psalm verse and the Traparian of the feast, and I sing another psalm verse and the Traparian of the feast, and I sing glory now and ever and the Kentuckian. That's really where this all came from. So on Sundays, we sing, going back to the third antiphon, Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Psalm 94, by the way. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim God our Savior. O Son of God, risen from the dead, save us who sing to you. Alleluia. Verse, refrain. And it says, go to page 25. And now we have the entrance hymn. We're still in the same psalm. We started in 94. We ended in 94. Come, let us worship and bow before Christ. And then we sing the Traparian and Kentuckian, right? This is really a big structure of psalm verses and Traparia and whatever. It's simple on Sundays because we don't repeat the Traparian on the feasts we do. When it feels on a feast day like Palm Sunday, like we're singing the Traparian over and over, that's the old-fashioned way. We're just doing the short form on Sundays and weekdays. Okay? So to recap... Sunday, Sunday or weekday first antiphon, we're good. Second antiphon, only begotten son. Third antiphon ends with the entrance hymn, the Traparian, and the Kentuckian, with glory now and ever in the middle. Okay? It feels, it probably feels like what I'm saying is complicated, but... It does, it does help if you let it settle in. If whenever you see entrance hymn on a feast, you're saying, oh, this is the end of the third antiphon psalm and we're like getting ready to go into church. Because the entrance into a church was a big deal, it has special hymns, like that entrance hymn. Now, when you get to the Traparia, we're not going to cover the Traparian melodies. Okay, We did that in the eight tones. We'll do it again in the future. I do have... How many people do not have the handout for the Traparian melodies we did for the eight tones? Okay. Or if you I, I printed extra. I just want you to have these. The, everything is three-hole punched. Okay. This is a cheat sheet that shows you the beginnings of the Traparian melodies. Okay. And the four Kentuckian melodies and the feast days that they come from. Remember, the, the reason that four of these tones have special melodies is because those were from big feast days. And they got borrowed for all the Kentucky to sing. For example, tone three started out as special for Christmas. Today the virgin gives birth to the transcendent one. And tone four started out as theophany. You have revealed yourself to the world today. And tone six, ascension. When you had fulfilled the plan of salvation for us. And tone eight, Pascha. Although you descended into the grave, O oh, immortal one. People loved those four melodies and said, let's use those for all the Kentuckia. And so they stuck. Okay? There is one thing that I 
to make your life easier at this point in the service. Because on Sundays, on Sundays it's easy peasy. You have the Traparian and the Glory Now and Ever and the Kentuckian all in one place. Okay? But for most other feast days, it just says text glory or glory now and ever without the music. Okay? On the MCI website, we go to a bunch of trouble. I don't mind, but it's, it's paper to print, to print out all the feast day stuff. And very often, what we print on the MCI website is exactly what is in this book, except that it adds glory now and ever written out under notes. Okay? On the MCI website, and I'm getting these laminated for next time, we have sheets that have all the music for glory now and ever in the eight tones. If you have those on the canter stand, then you're always ready to find that music. You'll save page flipping. You will save printing off, you know, extra stuff. Now, there are days when the handouts on the MCI website are important, like St. Nicholas falling on a Sunday, and things get complicated. But for ordinary Sundays and feasts, A, you should memorize how to sing Glory Now and Ever in the Kentucky tones, and B, you should have something on your canter stand with music. It saves flipping to try to find the tone. Okay? So, we've gotten to the end of the Kentakia, and at this point, where are the clergy? Anybody remember? Well, dur what, dur when, did, when did they go into the sanctuary? Okay, and it actually says in here that they go in while we sing the Trapari in Kentakia. Okay? Remember I said the Byzantine rite doesn't easily get rid... Oh, actually, yeah, I want to uh, keep going there. Uh, remember I said the Byzantine rite doesn't easily get rid of things? Some churches had the priests, the clergy, entering during the Trapari in Kentakia. Other places had them entering during the singing of a very particular Traparian, Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, and immortal, have mercy on us. So guess what we do? We sing both. We sing the Trapari and the Kentakia, and then we sing this ancient processional hymn, Holy God, holy, mighty, holy, and immortal, have mercy on us, three times. Glory now and ever, and then the end. This is the way this kind of form used to be sung. And then we sing it one, the refrain one more time, very solemnly. And that is used not only at the Divine Liturgy, but where else do we sing Holy God? Funeral. At a funeral. Okay. Where else? Processions, like on Holy Saturday Matins with a procession with the shroud. Okay. This is a processional hymn. Okay. It's one of the things we sing when we're going somewhere. Whether we're singing it to a Sunday melody or a funeral melody, that's what Holy God is for. It is processional, which means it should be sung somewhat slowly, solemnly, in a straightforward, in a really clear fashion. It's an important hymn. Doesn't mean drag. Everyone, does it, is there anyone who doesn't know the difference between singing slowly and dragging? Okay. It sounds pretty obvious, but everybody falls into that sometimes. When you sing, you should always be singing with full voice. That doesn't mean loud. It means with a certain intensity, if it sounds like you're falling asleep, if it sounds like you're bored, if it sounds like you're marking time while you're looking for the next page, there's a problem. Okay, and that's when the music tends to drag. So, if you will turn to the Holy God, we will look at that and then take a short break. Page 27, the Thrice Holy Hymn, Trisagia, Holy God. We have an A melody, and we have a B melody, and we have a C melody, we have a D melody, an E melody, we've got a whole bunch of options here, and an F melody marked for the faithful departed. Okay? I'd like, I'd like to just do a quick test. How, ma how many people know the A melody? Holy God, holy and mighty. Okay? Holy God, holy and mighty. Now, we had, for years and years, we had a little tiny book with music that had one melody for every piece of music in the liturgy, and this was the one that everybody got used to using. Okay? Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and 
This is lovely. It really swings. It can be very up kind of piece. Now, two things to watch out for. What happens if you start too low? <laughs> you are way down in the basement. Okay. Again, I would I would put in my book start kind of high, just as a reminder. Okay. Look, practice, recognize which pieces have special requirements. Okay, and this is one of them. Also. Mortal half. That's a big jump from the or end of the. Do fully what? Or they go up on that. Yeah. And, and and honestly, well, okay. I'm not going to talk much about canterisms. There are ways sometimes that you can try to recover from screw ups. I'm not going to talk much about that today. There are also ways that sometimes people just change things. But I'll tell you, the biggest thing that happens is cantors who basically sing a harmony to the melody that's in front of them. Okay, Eight times out of ten when somebody says, oh, that's not the way it goes, this is the way it goes, it's really a melody and a harmony that gets swapped somewhere. Okay, I don't lose sleep over that. It can be confusing to people that are following the music or that learned it somewhere else. And in general, the cantor is the one person in the church who should not be singing harmony. I love hearing harmony, especially natural harmony in our churches. It does wonderful things for the singing. Okay? The cantor has to sing the melody. Okay? Let somebody else be cantor before you sing harmony. So the fourth one. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal. Have mercy on us. Now this is a little bit more mournful. It's a lovely melody. Another one. Again, practice it. How many people are familiar with this one? About half. Okay. E. Holy God. Holy and mighty. Holy and immortal. Have mercy on us. How many? The fewer. Okay. And then finally, one. Please just use this for the departed. Don't use this on Sundays, even though it's short. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Now, some of these have the glory now and ever written out, and some have this recitative. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever and forever. Amen. Holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Now, once, the, once your people are familiar with a couple of those, you can switch these from week to week. You might pick a more festive one for a feast day. You might pick, you know, one of the more somber ones on a weekday. It's up to you. Okay? If, however, you're introducing a new one, please use it four or five or six weeks in a row at the same liturgy. Let Don't introduce something new and then not use it for a while. Because first, people will forget whatever they learned the first time. And second, they'll assume that it didn't work. And when you sing it again, they'll say, oh, that was the one we sang before, and we decided to stop using it. No, the cantor just didn't continue. Okay? When introducing music, do it sensibly. Now, on certain days, okay, and this is noted at the bottom, yes? The quick question about the Holy God and, and, and pitch selection. Yes. You said just pick something that's comfortable. Yeah. You, you don't have to worry about where the priest was and the responses at this point? No, be, no. At, at this, because... At the beginning, notice what's before this. You've ended not with a priest doing an invocation, but with the amen. Okay? Every time you start a new part of the service, you can pick a pitch. Okay? Don't go crazy. And if you can stay on the same, same dough, it gives a nice feel to it, but you don't have to. The people are going to expect you to start this hymn, and they're going to follow. Okay? Now, on most days, we do the Holy God. There are a few exceptions. 
on baptismal days of the church. That means the days that on the in the early church were set aside for baptism. We sing, we bow, we we sing, all you have been baptized, and it's listed on page thirty-one. Christmas, Nativity, Theophany, Lazarus Saturday, Pascha, Bright Week, and Pentecost. Okay, let's think about this. The original major baptismal day in the Byzantine Rite was Holy Saturday night. We've gone through Lent. We've gone through Holy Week, we've remembered the cross and the tomb, and just as we're celebrating the resurrection, we baptize a bunch of people. Long readings of the vigil liturgy and that sort of thing. Now, if somebody couldn't be there on Pascha, they were sick on Pascha, or they were detained or traveling or whatever, they would be baptized on Pentecost. And because Bright Week is really a seven-day celebration of Pascha, we do it on, on that, Pascha. Um, in some parts of the early church, they didn't baptize on Pascha. They baptized on Lazarus Saturday instead. Why? So you could spend Holy Week as Christian. We baptize you before Holy Week, and then all of Holy Week you can take part in all the services as a member of the faithful. Another way of doing it. And then finally, uh, because it might be a long time to wait to Pascha, Nativity and Theophany also became baptismal days. So anytime we sing this, means this is a day associated with baptism. And more often than not, if you look at the readings and prayers of the day, you will see references to baptism. And then on two, on two feasts of the cross, we sing, we bow to your cross, O Christ. What would those be? What are the two days we, that we do that? Exaltation of the cross, which is September 14th. Your cantors, learn these dates. And the third Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of the veneration of the cross. Okay? Now, again, there is an a mel- there are A melodies and B melodies of these. The Holy God, because we sing it so often, there are a bunch of versions. For these, we have two versions. The first one is a Russian version. Subcarpathian, from Mukachevo Ujarov Presho. The second one is a Galician or Ukrainian version, which is usually a little bouncier, a little popular, and tends to be the ones we use. The reason it doesn't say Rusin and Galician in here is because it would cause a war in some parishes with people saying, darn it, we're not Galician, we're not Ukrainian, don't call me Ukrainian. It doesn't matter, we sing their music, get over it. (laughs) You should learn both of them, okay? Because not only might, for example, even if your parish right now doesn't use one of them, a visiting priest may sing the first time through of We Bow to Your Cross to the other melody that you should be prepared to follow. Okay? Or you may be asked to canter in another parish where they don't know the version that you're used to. And whenever you're a visiting canter, is not a time to have teaching moments, if you can avoid it. <laughs> Okay, uh, when when you are helping out somewhere else, you don't you no longer follow your pastor's guidelines and your parish's tradition. You follow their pastor's guidelines, and to the extent you can, their parish's traditions. Now, all of this music is on the MCI website. Recordings at the top. There is also a seven CD set available from the bookstore, which will be open at noon. If you do not have a copy of this, I encourage you to get it. Okay? Almost all of the music in this book is recorded on those CDs. 